Welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is William Blacker. He teaches at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University College London. He also translates Ukrainian literature into English. Welcome, William. Thank you for having me. We know that uh, interest for Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian literature, and Ukrainian language has rapidly increased during the last two years of Russia's full-scale war. And before that, uh, for many people in the West, it was not even clear that Ukrainian language is a separate language with separate cultural and linguistic tradition. Uh, how do you experience uh, this revival of interest for Ukrainian language? And is it clear in the West that Ukrainian language is different from the Russian one? Um, I think now it's becoming clearer and clearer. Um, sadly, it took the full-scale war of the last two years to really bring Ukraine into the um, cultural consciousness of many people in in Europe and beyond. Um, you know, I've been working in this field for for some time and very often you do have to start from the very, very basics, explaining to people, you know, that Ukraine didn't just appear out of nowhere in 1991, that Ukrainian culture and literature has a long uh, and rich history. Um, and also, yeah, that the, the language is a distinct language and has um, has a completely separate life from Russian. Um, and it's... It, it's, I think things have improved uh, greatly over the last two years. People are genuinely interested. People genuinely, I can see many people genuinely want to understand. Uh, you can't necessarily blame people for, for not being aware of certain things before, um, you know, if information wasn't made available to them. Um, but I can see that there is this big, um, big tendency, strong tendency um, among many spheres and many spheres of just among academia or in cultural circles or just in the general public to just figure out what's happening and understand something about Ukraine. Um, and the, the language is, is a big part of that. And I've seen, you know, there's been quite a big uptick in people learning uh, Ukrainian as a foreign language. Uh, certainly, I can see that in my own uh, university, but I know that uh, elsewhere, for example, the um, Ukrainian Institute London uh, teaches Ukrainian language and they've had an overwhelming demand for Ukrainian language. So things 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 are changing for the better, for sure, albeit in very tragic circumstances. But uh, this development when for decades, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian culture, and uh, I repeat, it is a, a culture of a nation with over 40 million people population that is as much, almost as much as the United Kingdom has. Uh, that this culture has been ignored and was unknown in uh, the West. Was it a sort of uh, some uh, propaganda campaign and genocidal practices by the Russian Empire? How do you explain it? Yeah, it's a big question. And I think there's no simple single answer to this, to why it's uh, it's been like that. I think partly it's to do with things happening in Ukraine and in the states that have ruled over Ukraine, and partly it's to do with attitudes from the West. Um, I think, for a start, um, c coming from the perspective of the West, and I can speak more about the UK, but I think this applies also to other Western European uh, countries, um, there is a tendency to understand culture in relation to political power. Uh, so we associate uh, cultural greatness with uh, political or military or imperial greatness. You know, so a country that has a long history of statehood, which has been a powerful state in history, um, is considered to have a superior culture automatically. Um, of, of course, those things do not automatically follow. They, they're not automatically associated with one another. Um, having an empire, having the military might to conquer large territories doesn't mean that your culture is any better than the next culture. Um, however, what it does mean is that uh, you have wealth, you have resources uh, to create cultural institutions. Uh, you know, so if we speak about literature, uh, why is it that um, English and French literature, for example, are known the world over uh, and are considered, you know, the, the kind of at the, the peak of the Western canon? Well, of course, that's connected with political power. It's connected with the history of empire. 
is connected with these these being large Western European wealthy states, uh, which are able to support uh, the languages, uh, the state languages and the state culture, and use it as an element of soft power as well. Um, they create institutions, they can support writers, they can support theatres, they can support, you know, whatever. Uh, if you look at somewhere like uh, Ukraine, you know, it's remarkable, you look at the history of Ukrainian uh, literature, it's writers writing against the most adverse conditions, where they don't have institutional support, they don't have um, resources, they often don't even have access to printing in the state that they live in. You know, if you look at the late 19th century Russian Empire, um, so you have to you have a cultural community which is doesn't have everything handed to it on a plate like you do with you know a, a writer maybe in Paris or London. Uh, they have to be extremely dedicated. They have to um, have this sense, often a sense of mission, uh, to pursue this cultural mission despite adverse conditions, despite oppression. Um, but it, it does have an effect on the culture. It means that, you know, historically it's been quite difficult for, for example, Ukrainian writers to write big long novels because they haven't had the time and the space and the access to print and publishing that makes that possible. That's why it's, it's one reason why, you know, poetry was such an important genre in, in Ukrainian culture because it's smaller, it's easier to produce, it takes less time, it's easier to distribute without having access to um, to you know publishing to institutions um, so it does have a powerful effect on uh, what the culture is able to do um, it doesn't make the culture you know qualitatively qualitatively better or worse but it makes some things certain things possible in one culture that are not possible in another culture and and Ukraine has really suffered from that um, and what, 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 from a Western perspective, we tend to look, you know, in, in the UK, from we, we have our culture, we tend to look at cultures similar to ours. So it's French, uh, which also had an empire, which has a similar type of cultural development to us, um, German, etc. Uh, we don't really understand places like, you know, uh, like Ukraine or like, let's say, Slovakia or um, Hungary these countries which don't have that long history of um, uh, uninterrupted statehood, of always having access to cultural institutions and always being able to support cultural institutions to push their own cultures. Uh, we don't really know how to read those cultures, we don't really understand them, we, we find it a bit hard to place them on our me mental maps of the world, which are very post-imperial. Um, so that, I think, we struggle with a little bit, with a, with a kind of... Uh, this sort of imperial hangover that we have, that we still associate culture with a certain type of uh, political status and power. Um, but obviously, you know, what's happening inside Ukraine, like I said, um, has a big influence on the ability of Ukrainians to kind of get their culture out into the world. Uh, if you are talking about the 19th century uh, in Ukraine um, and in the Soviet period, you see... Um, the political structures placed around Ukraine in such a way as to make it very difficult for Ukraine to have a cultural dialogue with the outside world. Uh, so for, you know, at various times, uh, it's been very difficult, if not impossible, to translate uh, works of literature into Ukrainian, to get them published, because the Russian Empire didn't want Ukraine to have its own independent cultural dialogue with the outside world. It wants everything to go through Russian. That was enforced in law at certain certain times in history, um, and the same going the other way. Um, you know what can uh, Ukrainians promote to uh, foreign audiences? What can be translated? Uh, that is severely limited. And, and in Soviet times, for example, you get very uh, limited flow of certain chosen authors being translated, but really not being promoted in in, in the way that they they could be and should be. Um, so that so those powerful states, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, have acted as this um, very strict, often quite brutal gatekeeper of Ukrainian culture, stopping it from getting out into the world. And uh, we may not forget also that uh, many writers and poets have been uh, literally killed by the Russians uh, all the time. Uh, we know in the early uh, 30s uh, the so-called executed renaissance of the Ukrainian uh, 
historians, uh, writers, journalists, uh, teachers, uh, where the whole generation of the Ukrainian intellectual elite has been erased, uh, arrested and killed, are uh, currently in uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war. We know that uh, many Ukrainian writers, uh, they have died on the front line. Uh, Volodymyr Vakulenko, um, a children books author, has been kidnapped and executed in the city of Izium in Kharkiv region early this full-scale invasion. And another Ukrainian poet, uh, Victoria Amelina, who uh, came to his grave and found his uh, diary, which he secretly was writing during the, uh, during the occupation. She was killed uh, just weeks after that in a missile strike on Kramatorsk. Um, I don't mention uh, Vasil Stus, a Ukrainian poet and potentially a Nobel Prize winner, who has been uh, effectively killed in a Soviet uh, camp uh, in early 80s. Uh, every time when Ukraine produces its poets and writers, uh, the generation gets erased. And then the Russians ask, OK, where are your Nobel Prize winners? You have killed them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's um, that is the most that's the extreme end of those processes that I've been discussing. You know, the, the, the states, uh, these repressive states are willing to not only resort to censorship, or, um, you know, more soft tactics like just not giving access to resources to certain types of writers and to certain type of literature, um, but also literally destroying them. Um, I mean, we, the, the, the process is, is a very long one and you, you could, it's hard to even find, you know, what's the, what's the beginning date of this happening in relation to... Um, Russian sort of cultural hegemony over Ukraine. You could even look at sort of seventeenth, eighteenth century restrictions on on printing under uh, under Peter the First, for example. Um, but really, I suppose the middle of the nineteenth century, when we have the uh, arrest of a number of Ukrainian intellectuals, Taras Shevchenko among them, um, seen as you know not the first modern Ukrainian writer, but um, seen as certainly the founder of, U of Ukrainian literature, the national poet, uh, and his story is one of being uh, oppressed and um, excluded from culture in many ways. Um, you know, he was born a serf, he did not receive a formal education, um, he was able to become an artist within the structures of the empire through 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 overcoming some difficulties to do so, but he, he was able to do that. Um, then welcomed into imperial the imperial literary culture uh, to a degree before he became more political. And then when these uh, more anti-imperial political writings were discovered, he's arrested and sent into exile for 10 years, banned from writing. And we have the start of that process where we, we have to start thinking about all those works of Ukrainian literature that were never written. Um, you know, like, like I was saying before, the conditions in which a, a writer works are extremely important. It's not just enough to be talented, to have inspiration and ideas. You have to have the conditions to work in. If you're sent to uh, into uh, forced military service in Central Asia and banned from writing, well, then it's going to be pretty hard for you to work. And Shevchenko did actually continue to write. Uh, he, 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 his... You know, his work didn't end at that moment. He sort of defied the, the ban. But we can only imagine what he would have been able to do if he had had the same uh, conditions as, you know, other writers in the Russian Empire, as, as the, you know, the great Russian classics who are uh, writing around about the same time. You know, sometimes also suffering from various types of political repression. But still, if, uh, when we compare to the case of Shevchenko, um, enjoying much easier conditions, much better conditions. So, you know, what, what could that Ukraine's national poet who already wrote so much and achieved so much, what could he have done um, if he had had the conditions to work in? And that, that continues um, throughout, uh, uh, you know, the, the, there are variations in the level of repressiveness of the Russian Empire and then in the Soviet Union. But like you said, the 1930s probably being the most extreme example when uh, we have in the 20s, uh, this moment in Soviet Ukraine where we have this generation who basically sees the opportunity, uh, they use the uh, creation of the Soviet Ukrainian Republic to uh, bring about this uh, renaissance in Ukrainian culture, 
um, which is uh, permitted by the state at that time, but then is really brutally um, cut short with imprisonments, executions in, in the 1930s. And again, we can only we can only imagine how many great novels were not written. You know, and a lot of these writers were are people who are arrested and uh, imprisoned and executed when they're young, and they've, they've you know people like Piet Mohine or Johansson and all of these kind of great writers of the avant-garde who are just really in the early to mid stages of their careers. You know, they've, they've not yet come to their full powers as writers and it's the whole generation is cut off. You know, so there's, the, there's a sort of whole library that we can imagine of these great works that were never written because of this, uh, these processes. Um, and also just not, not just works that were not written because the, author, the, the authors were murdered, but also works that were written but then were destroyed. Um, so we think about uh, some works by Mikola Khlyovey, who's one of the leaders of that uh, generation, you know, uh, prose works which were, we know existed but were, have been lost, destroyed by the NKVD. Same with Vasev Stus, you know, some of his work also destroyed uh, deliberately. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a story of great, uh, great violence against people, but violence against culture in the most literal sense. That is a very interesting uh, perspective. Um, and my next question, uh, which I would like to ask you, is about like, uh, do you see any continuation of this suppression uh, policy uh, in uh, what Russia is doing now? But before you could answer it, don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. And if you have something to say about uh, what we're talking about now, about Ukrainian culture and uh, how it was suppressed and how Ukrainian language and Ukrainian writers have been suppressed, don't forget to leave your comments under this uh, video. We're talking uh, with William uh, Blacker, who teaches at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University College London, and he also translates Ukrainian literature into English. So how do you see, are there any repeated patterns of Russia's policy towards Ukraine? I mean, yeah, we can see that the this attitude has not... Uh, the strategy has not disappeared. Um, we know that you know the invading Russian forces did have uh, information about people in the areas they were occupying who could be local activists or local cultural figures. They knew who to target, and the people they wanted to target among those people were people who promote Ukrainian culture, who are involved in education uh, at a local level. Um, and we can see that the policies of the, when they occupy these areas, they are de-Ukrainianizing them. Uh, you know, so the school switches to, uh, school switch to Russian, they are destroying Ukrainian books, they're shipping in uh, Russian books to, to fill up the libraries. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's a process of uh, cultural er erasure. You know, we we could argue that it's uh, an element of a genocidal policy, and people have been making that argument, and I think it's it's uh, it's a strong one. Um, there is uh, just as as there have been under the Russian Empire, under the Soviet Union, you know, these attempts to russify the population in order to politic neutralize Ukraine politically. Um, because if people lose that sense of a distinctive culture, a distinctive history, a distinctive social and political existence, coherence, um, then that big obstacle to Russian imperialism disappears. And, and in Ukraine has been, in many ways, it, it's kind of the key to Russia's status as an empire. Uh, if we think about when Russia becomes an empire, um, you know, truly becomes an empire, probably with the conquering of Ukraine in various stages in the 18th century. Um, very, I would say very significantly uh, under Catherine, the southeastern territories of Ukraine and Crimea. Um, you know, Crimea is always really key in these processes. Um, Ukraine has been that big central part of Russian imperial sense, sense, sense of itself as an empire. Um, and Ukraine has resisted, and Ukraine had a, had had a, you know, had an existence 
in not not as a state called Ukraine before that, but it had a cultural existence, had a political culture of its own, um, had its political institutions before the Russian Empire existed. Um, it's always been this big, you know, obstacle in the way, um, and it's always it's always resisted. It's always been this this um, thing which Russia can never quite conquer. And it's extremely important because, um, you know, the Russian sort of national idea has always been so wrapped up with a sense of itself as an empire, with a sense of itself as having this kind of um, almost kind of God-given right and mission to expand uh, its power. And, in, you know, in the, <laughs> We're talking about uh, Ukrainian culture, but in Russian culture hasn't really been able to figure out a way not to do that. Um, you know, the, the 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 literature and the culture hasn't really offered an alternative vision, um, and that's I think what Russians need to be working on right now, because only when we only when that sense of um, Russia's sense of itself is is uh, separated from this urge towards colonial violence, then we will have some kind of peace. Um, that is exactly uh, what we can observe in, uh, in the Ukrainian literature. If you read Taras Shevchenko, who you have already mentioned, or Ivan Franko, or even Lesya Ukrainka, uh, you can see that uh, this idea of fight for independence, for, uh, for how the Ukrainians can uh, set their own way and live their own life free and this cause for freedom uh, they are the same if you open some verses by Taras Shevchenko or Franco you will see they could have been written today it is actually the same fight the same struggle and vice versa if you read the the, the Russian literature the classic Russian literature is about the uh, in Pushkin in Lermontov there is a lot of admiration of imperial conquest of the Caucasus, this romanticism of uh, the imperial uh, the imperial conquest of the of the people and when they write about Ukraine they write about Ukraine as if it were like an interesting exotic province which they can have but sometimes it's boring like Pushkin hated Odessa because it was for him like not Petersburg not the capital. Yeah I mean I think that the two literatures um are inevitably engaged in a in a in a sort of very tense confrontation or dialogue of sorts. Um, you know, we. I, I like to think when I think about Ukrainian literature, I don't like to start from its relationship with Russia and Russian culture because I think it. You know, it has. We can talk about it on its own terms, and we can talk about it in relation to other histories, other em, other empires, if we want to talk about that. We can talk about it in relation to Europe and world, world culture. But yeah, of course, we can't get around the fact that Russia has always been this looming presence, you know, uh, next to Ukraine, has always been uh, interfering, always been bringing these in these regular waves of, of, uh, of uh, colonial violence. Um, but what, what colon all empires, all colonial situations leads to... Um, cultural overlaps, cultural hybridities, you know, you get, cu cultures are never, there aren't neat borders between culture, and that's not just the case of Ukraine, it's any culture. Uh, there are always places on the edges where um, cultures, languages overlap, where they, they, they exist together um, simultaneously, sometimes in competition, sometimes in dialogue, um, sometimes in solidarity. Uh, and Ukraine is a really interesting example of that. Um, but certainly, you know, Ukrainian literature is often answering certain things. In in Russian literature, it's looking at um, it's looking at certain developments in Russian literature and writing back to the empire. You know, I think Shevchenko is doing that. You know, even Kotlerevsky did that um, with uh, his work. You know, responding in his plays to images of Ukraine that were created in Russian culture, which he, f he found to be, um, you know, simplistic and stereotypical and, and inaccurate about what Ukraine is. Um, even, you know, uh, one figure in, in this sense who often comes up is Gogol, um, who, again, the, known to the world as a Russian writer, you can, you can read, you know, 
uh, textbooks for students in the English language published fairly recently, which will just discuss Gogol almost without mentioning Ukraine. Um, a writer who was born in Ukraine, raised in Ukraine, and wrote about Ukraine exactly. uh, is seen as a Russian writer. That is actually the typical appropriation, which, uh, which can be seen also not only in the area of literature, also in the area of, um, of art like uh, Kuinji, uh, the, the, the artist who uh, lived in uh, Mariupol, or uh, Repin, uh, who always like plight with these this Ukrainian topics in his books and finally uh, emigrated from Russia uh, to Finland uh, after the revolution as soon as he could. But uh, when we talk about the, mod the modern perception of this, um, of this situation and of the Ukrainian literature, when you translate books uh, from Ukrainian into, into English, what resonates uh, in the hearts of the uh, British readers most? What uh, what new values and new uh, experiences can Ukrainian literature bring to the British audience? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, and when you operate in the world of translated literature, you always have to think about um, how do you, you know, to put it kind of bluntly, how do you sell this to these readers? Um, what's the what's the unique selling point? Um, and Ukrainian literature has has many, I think. I mean, the the first, the main thing that is in has been in demand over the last two years is certainly literature about the war. So there's a demand from publishers, from literary agents, to find writers who are writing about what's happening now, because people, it's in the headlines, and people want to know in more depth. They want to understand Ukraine in more depth. They want to understand the war in more depth. And and people know that literature is one way of of doing that. Um, you know, every war in history has produced its own literature, and uh, and and this it's one of the really remarkable things about Ukrainian literature over the last ten years is Ukrainian war literature. You know, which when I started to study Ukrainian literature, I never thought I would be talking about that, but uh, it's really been one of the defining things. And and there is a new, there there really is a new war literature coming out of Ukraine, which is very distinctive. Uh, and, and in some ways, it's, of course, this similar topics recur in war literature throughout history. Um, but the Ukrainian, new Ukrainian war literature is quite uh, distinct and specific. Um, and I think it speaks about war in a very interesting way. Um, and that appeals to readers, it's something that readers want to know about. Um, but I think also what we, those of us who kind of promote Ukrainian literature and think about Ukrainian literature, we have to think about what, um, what next, because that interest won't last forever. Uh, sadly, that's just the cynical nature of the market. It's the nature of people's attention spans. Um, we, you know, we saw similar things after the wars in Yugoslavia. You know, these writers came to prominence because of what's happening, and people wanted to read about the wars. But then, that interest fades away. So, you know, we have to think: what is it? What are the other things about Ukrainian literature and culture that uh, can appeal? And I think, I think there are many. Um, you know, I think uh, that what I was speaking about before is uh, is interesting to contemporary readers. You know, Ukraine as a, a post-colonial culture, as a culture that's, that's formed in this very interesting, rich um, territory that is today's Ukraine, that was between empires, that had many languages functioning there at the same time, that had many different peoples living there, very diverse and multicultural. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a culture that can speak about that experience of empire, and it can speak about that experience of cultural hybridity. It can speak about the experience of um, political powerlessness, shifting borders, uh, shifting identities, all of these kind of things which are very modern topics, actually. Uh, you know, when we think about the, the problems in the world, it often is that we're thinking, that many people are thinking about at the moment, they are thinking about how to think about the legacy of empire, in, in, often in the Western context, but Ukraine has this very unique perspective on that, something very interesting to add to that conversation. Uh, it's thinking about how different peoples coexist together in the same spaces. It's thinking about, you know, processes of 
migration and mixing of peoples. And those these are all Ukrainian topics. Um, and, I th and, and looking, if you look back through the history of Ukrainian literature, you can find a lot of really interesting um, perspectives on these things. If you look at the modern Ukrainian writers, uh, we have um, a lot of them, and um, the fact that Ukraine supported uh, publishing uh, in Ukrainian language since uh, several years uh, has led to a blooming period for the Ukrainian publishing houses and brought more um, uh, Ukrainian writers uh, to the to the world, like who finally had their chance to publish their books in Ukrainian and in their own country. Um, do we know now, like what kind of besides the the war books, uh, what kind of of literature can resonate in 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 Europe, in the UK in particular, and uh, can we uh, expect some sort of uh, more understanding for what is going on in Ukraine? Can we stop looking at Ukraine through the the Russian optics? Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, I think it's, you know, for a long time, um, the only authors from Ukraine who you could find in translation would be, you know, Gogol, who is presented as a Russian writer, and the main works that are translated are, are the, the works set in Russia. Or maybe Bulgakov, you know, who comes from Kiev, but... Uh, and right But who now. also saw himself as a Russian, and it's frankly speaking, he, he hated Kiev. Yeah, yeah, and, and had, a, had a very... Um, negative sort of uh, attitude towards Ukrainian statehoods um, and so on. But, you know, that's that the White Guard would be one novel that, you know, you often see like journalists who come from the UK or other places and they come to Kiev and they think, well, what can I read to kind of, you know, put into my reports or, or my writing that uh, relates to this? Oh, I'll read Bulgakov's White Guard. And that's how they're coming into Ukraine and understanding Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's a very, very... Um, you know, fine, read, read Bulgakov, of course, you should understand what this person was writing and, and why he was writing in the context, but if you want to understand Ukraine, then it's not the place to start. Um, I think with the, with the contemporary writers, um, I think one thing that certainly appeals to readers in, of English language translated fiction um, I mean, it's hard to generalize, but I would say, you know, his works that deal with history, works that deal with kind of history and memory, those seem to be quite popular at the moment. You know, if you look at the, the International Booker Prize, was won by Georgi Gospodinov for this novel Time Shelter, which is all about memory and history, um, but also sort of contemporary politics and populism. Um, and there are, there are some writers in Ukraine who are doing very interesting things, thinking about those problems. Um, you know, I'm thinking about... For example, um, Tanya Maryarchuk, whose novel um, was just translated into English. It's just been published at the moment. Um, it's um, forgetting, I forget the precise title now, but it's like for, forgettingness, I think. They, they translated it in this kind of unusual way. Zabutya in Ukrainian. Um, a very, very interesting novel which goes back from the present or you know, the sort of post post independence period back into history deals with um, uh, 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 Polish Ukrainian relations in the interwar period, and uh, it, it, the main character is Vyacheslav Lipinski, this you know very important sort of um, political thinker, intellectual of the mid century, um, but uh, which doesn't sound like the most maybe. Uh, the topic that would really grab you, but it's really, really, you know, nicely written, very well written, and it tells you a lot about Ukraine, but it's also, it's a novel that's structured very interestingly, it's going back and forth in time, it's thinking about how we, in the present, we relate to the past. Um, another one would be Sofia Androkhovich's Amadoka, which has also been translated at the moment, a big novel, again, very ambitious novel, going, it start, deals partly with the executed Renaissance, deals partly with the Holocaust, deals with uh, the contemporary war, it's kind of, it's going beyond just writing about the immediate uh, events that are happening now, and it's thinking about them in historical perspective, it's introducing the reader to a whole different side of not just Ukrainian, but European history, um, through these very interesting narratives, through these individual stories that are being traced. So I think these kind of writers um, have uh, have a lot of potential to, to reach readers.
what was for you during the last um, couple of years uh, the most complicated thing to uh, translate, uh, to explain, to, to bring into the English-speaking context? Uh, you mean like things that I actually translated? Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, oft often translating Ukrainian literature, um, you are dealing with contexts which you know are going to be unfamiliar to the reader. Um, so that's a big challenge, um, uh, you know, to how, how academic to make it, how, how, you know, do I use footnotes, how do I explain these things? That can be kind of a struggle, um, but, but not always, you know, I think it's, I've done quite a lot of translation of poetry recently um, because and, and the, the really flourishing of Ukrainian poetry in relation to the war has been very interesting. Um, poetry, again, is this very nimble, fast genre which people can write relatively quickly and publish on social media and it just goes out there. Um, and that has been, I found, often very immediately comprehensible in translation. Um, you know, it's always difficult to translate poetry, but you can see that Ukrainian writers, um, you know, like Victoria Amelina, for example, who started to write poetry, actually, and she wasn't really a poet before, but um, so after the invasion, she, she wrote poetry. Uh, Irina Shovalova is another writer that I work with, uh, Ia Kiva. Um, I haven't translated, but I've, I've really admired uh, translations of her work. Um, and they are able to speak about the specifics of this war in a very universal way, in a very powerful way that, that speaks directly to people on, a, on this kind of human level. Um, and it doesn't need contextualizing. Um, you know, it really works. If there is any book, like one book, which you could recommend uh, to people who say, okay, I want to read one book about Ukraine, from Ukraine, to understand the soul of this nation, what would it be? Oh, it's such a difficult question. Um, it's really hard to think of like one single book that would be the one I would, uh, that I would recommend. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the problems is that a lot of the classics are not translated yet. So, you know, Shevchenko is translated, but we need a nice, big, easily accessible, well-translated edition of Shevchenko's works. Um, I would say it's worth going to Lesy Ukrainka, and there are new translations of her work just being published. So the um, Harvard University Press and there's a Harvard Ukrainian uh, Research Institute has a special translation program at the moment. Um, and they've published, they, or they are in the process of publishing Lesy Ukrainka's plays. So Cassandra is one of them, which is not a play which is about Ukraine, it's about the siege of Troy. But it's, but the Ukrainian situation um, and imperial dynamics and uh, problems to do with um, disinformation, truth and lies, uh, who has the right to speak, who is silenced, um, the gender dynamics of that, because the central character is a woman uh, who wants to speak in the context of a war. Um, I think that's a really brilliant play, and it's brilliantly translated, and it's it's about to be released. Uh, so I would say, yeah, check out Lesy Ukrainka's Cassandra, translated by Nina Murray, who's a fantastic translator. And that is an amazing advice. I personally love Lesy Ukrainka. Uh, she, she's traveled a lot. Uh, she lived in the 19th century, traveled a lot, was a translator also. Yeah. And uh, what personally resonates uh, in my heart uh, when she traveled to another city and uh, when she was invited by your uh, relatives to stay in their houses, they said, oh, no, no, thank you. I, I really appreciate it, but I better stay in the hotel because I just want to have like a, a, a bit of privacy. And for 19th century, it was uh, too radical and uh, not every relative understood it. But when I read about it, I said, oh, my God, like uh, the, the classic writers of uh, the Ukrainian literature, they, they, they live through the same through the same uh, experience uh, in all day experience which we sometimes have and that made for me less Ukrainka much more understandable as a person as a personality who uh, lived her life not only wrote your books or translated them uh, thank you so much it was William uh, Blacker
He teaches at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University College uh, London. He is a translator of Ukrainian literature into English. Thank you so much for your time, William, and I'll take care. You're welcome. Thank you.